Everyone's talking about digital transformation, the innovative use of data to enable new ways of doing business. But digital transformation doesn't happen by accident. It requires concrete action like leveraging public cloud services, modernizing your data center, implementing DevOps, and putting artificial intelligence to work. In short, digital transformation calls for rethinking IT infrastructure. Hi, I'm Stan Gibson, and I'll be your host and moderator for this webcast. Joining me to explore how to build an IT infrastructure to enable digital transformation are Alan Klingerman, Chief Technology Strategist for PowerEdge Plus Workloads at Dell Technologies. Welcome, Alan. It's great to have you here for this webcast. Great to be here. And Andrew Nelson, Principal Architect at Insight. Welcome, Andrew, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, Sam. Happy to be here. Thanks. Alan and Andrew, to start off, let's take a look at where all IT traditionally begins, the data center. What needs to be done in the data center to enable business transformation? So this is an interesting topic for um, Insight specifically is um, we have a, a long pedigree in data center infrastructure, and we've been helping our clients pivot to uh, what we call uh, mod ops or modern operations. It's leveraging a lot of the same technology we've used, but using it in a very public cloud-centric way. Similar to your intro, Stan, uh, customers have gotten a taste of the public cloud and like that uh, operating model where they can swipe a credit card and provision assets, and we need to adapt to that mentality in the data center. Um, this is super important with our, our uh, vendor partners like Dell, for example, to be able to use infrastructure that lends itself really well to that uh, to that operating model. I mean, Alan, you guys are very proud of, of some of your, your infrastructure that enables automation and automa uh, automatic provisioning and, and the like. Do you want to talk about some of those pieces in Dell's portfolio? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, thanks for that, Andy. And I think you laid it out very well for the listeners there. Uh, when we think about this kind of journey of modern IT transformation, right, we, we kind of think about it in five key pillars or five modern architectural attributes to all of our platforms. Uh, everything must be flash enabled, right? Which gives us great consistent performance uh, that's very predictable in nature and obviously can help us reduce cost and provide better SLAs to the business, just like you alluded with the public cloud providers. Uh, in today's day and age, right? Everything has to be cloud enabled. This is a hybrid cloud world. We all know it. Uh, it's how do I take those specific applications and workloads and put them in the best place for the business? Uh, in the current data center, we really look at it that everything needs to have a scale out approach, right? Very modern and software defined uh, to take advantage of all the automation that, that customers are getting out of cloud based services. And then we think about trust, right? Of being able to do things from a secure level to encrypt, you know, data in flight and at rest. So, the extremely important journey, and we think about it in context of workloads and applications, right, of both existing workloads that they're just looking to, through that modernize, automate, and transform lens, reduce their cost, provide better security, improve reliability and control, while they're also trying to innovate, right, using cloud-native type approaches to improve their time to market, really bring digital innovation to the business for new lines of revenue and profit and to give them scale and differentiation. And you might have heard about this little thing uh, from us called Apex, right? We're certainly reaching to everything as a service. And when we think about it in kind of four kind of key tenets of what we're doing to bring that to market, it's about providing flexible consumption, right, at its core for all the reasons that Andy just kind of mentioned. A nice integrated council experience, just like what you're used to in the public cloud, but maintained and op, uh, you know maintained by Dell, so you don't have to worry about your IT operations from a firmware perspective. I only need to think about the the components that set above that. Uh, certainly, both ourselves and partners like Insight provide significant value for customers in the space through you know MSP type services, and then certainly really designed for this modern era of, as things move towards an OpEx model. Yeah, let's talk about the, the OpEx model and consumption. So you hit on a couple words that are part and parcel to our mod op strategy. As you talked about a different consumption model, you talked about uh, cloud native, which is becoming a buzzword. But the, the driver for all of that infrastructure and Apex's as a service model is a, is a different uh, app owner or a different consumer. So our, our big push internally is to not think about IT assets as infrastructure like we have for 20 plus years. And a lot of what we just talked about are, are architectural nuances and assets, 
the new school IT operations doesn't want to think about servers, doesn't want to think about storage, doesn't want to think about networking. Again, they want to swipe a credit card. They want to talk to an API gateway. They want to trigger a workflow and sit back and wait for their assets to show up. And and we can thank Jeff Bezos and Amazon and Google and, and, and all those folks for that. But it's really treating the app owners and the developers as our end consumer rather than you know, um, traditional IT buyers, if you will. And that's a big mentality change that drives all of the stuff that you just went through, Alan. It drives all of those new consumptions, new financial models, new acquisition models, new life cycling models. And, and the reason that's important is that it takes new infrastructure and, and new offerings from somebody like Dell, like Apex, for example, to, to be able to accommodate that new buying model. Hopefully that bookends no, that conversation both ways, guys. Alan and Andrew, perhaps we could delve a little further into hybrid cloud. What is the best way to integrate cloud-based services with the on-premises data center? So this is probably the trickiest conversation we deal with right now as an integrator at Insight. Um, we do a lot with the cloud providers, and we also have a, a deep tenure and experience with um, a lot of the manufacturers like Dell, for example. And Dell is supplying a, a lot of infrastructure and assets into the, the hybrid cloud vendors as well. But stitching together these old and new operating models is is really tricky, and it's it's literally what I was just talking about in the previous question: is the traditional assets that are on premises for a customer have to be operated like a form of a private cloud. It has to be operationalized in the same way the cloud is. We have to have chargeback, and we have to have management tools that can straddle multiple clouds and potentially on premises environments. Uh, and what we're seeing in our client base is something similar to, I think, what Dell is seeing is customers that went all in on the public cloud are finding out that there's certain workloads that don't belong there and pulling them back into a data center or a co-location facility. They're also finding out that certain workloads may not be appropriate in the cloud and might need to be out at the edge and need to sit in a in an oil rig out in the Gulf of Mexico or in a refinery in the middle of the U.S. somewhere. And, and that ends up having to start to operate like a cloud. Um, so it's it's mostly operations and the tooling and the way that we think about the assets. The the assets that are in place are very similar to what we've used for a long time for, for a long time in our industry, but the way that we operate and manage and cost justify and life cycle them starts to change, similar to what we were just talking about. And uh, I love what you just said there, Andy, and it's a hundred percent right on of you know, when I think about the, it's really the cloud as a destination. It's not a destination, but an operating model. And when I think about that, right, it, it really is kind of three primary areas that we see in all of our conversations with our customers worldwide. It's really the laws of physics, right? We can only move ones and zeros so fast. It's about uh, speed, performance, and latency to make real-time decisions for uh, the business, especially at the edge, as you just described. Uh, kind of the laws of the land, right? So we know there's compliance concerns that cause data gravity to be a real issue. And then there's cost because there's some workloads, right, that just may be not cost effectively run in the public cloud. So we take a, a really different type of approach of looking at the application and workloads, and, and we have a great modernization strategy. We think about it almost like a, a quadrant, if you think about four boxes, uh, in the upper right-hand side, it's almost a little bit like the magic quadrant from, from Gartner. We think about those applications that have and provide high business value, uh, but they very expensive to the business to run. Those are the ones that we want to really focus on modernization, right? And that's where we can take and move them to a container or platform as a service model using things such as the Tanzu container grid sitting on top of VMware Cloud Foundation. Uh, maybe it's just an outright replacement. They want to sh lift and shift. They're on a old school CRM and, and they want to go to a, a, a you know, SaaS based operating model for that application. They want to move to uh, Salesforce, for example. Uh, SaaS is a real thing, right? So, hey, look, there's another vector there at that application level. What am I going to do? Uh, from a cloud migration perspective, right? This is that area of infrastructure as a service. It gets very interesting. And I think about SaaS and PaaS and CAS as I just kind of talked about. That's really where the growth is in public cloud. IaaS or infrastructure as a service, right? Uh, while it's continuing to grow, it has a lot of a lot of challenges that I just described. Especially when I go back to the laws of physics and laws of the land, uh, just running infrastructure with a set of unknown workloads 
I, I can't predict what that looks like to the business because stakeholders can actually do things that put the business at risk that they're not even aware of. You bring up a good point there, Alan, around the risk and operations of cloud. That's the big challenge in that hybrid cloud model is, is not so much technology, but getting the client to think differently about their assets and their operating models and their security and their risk. That, that, that's one of the big conversations we're having with customers is not a technology discussion, but how do we pivot your business and how do you operate differently? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. And then that that last pillar that we just kind of walked through of the modernization of the current data center, right, with those five key attributes that I walked through of them moving things to a modern infrastructure that do benefit from running on-prem. Uh, so we think about modernizing those applications, again, that are high value but high cost. I think about migrating applications that uh, are, you know, lower cost but high value and then I think about really that innovation engine as we're talking about digital transformation that all of us just kind of alluded to. What are those ones that are of high uh, value, right, uh, but low cost? Man, those are great things. Of That's where I want to incubate new technologies in that lower left-hand side to kind of go, hey, look, this shows promise. I've written an application to provide XYZ either to my customer or as a service to uh, my base. What can I do to continue to grow that, right? Because I, I really want to foster incubation using a modern DevOps type approach with a set of custom customized applications and containers uh, to go to market with. You mentioned the edge, and Michael Dell has spoken about Dell's edge to core to cloud strategy. To our digital transformation, what should infrastructure look like at the edge? The edge is uh, definitely an interesting, you know, vector, right? When I think about the edge, and in fact, we're starting to change uh, some of our vernacular that you just alluded to there of edge core cloud uh, to more about now of edge and cloud, because what is the core anymore? What What is IT core? <laughs> Everything's kind of an edge, right? Living adjacent to the cloud. Uh, so we're starting to think about edge everywhere, but there are, we really need to then think about if I have edge everywhere, what are those areas that make, you know, the physicality very important for a device or asset, right? Given some of the constraints that Andy already alluded to earlier, we think about environmental constraints and those, uh, you know, scenarios that he just drew out. Uh, I'll even call one out, obviously, in telco with the 5G build out, doing huge things in that space at the bottom of a cell tower, right? Sitting in the middle of nowhere. Bandwidth and latency, back to my law of physics, right? That's a huge concern. If I'm going to take real-time action, I need to make sure that I have good throughput and low latency to, to achieve that. Otherwise, that action might have already caused downstream effects. If I'm a manufacturer and I'm trying to look uh, and use uh, intelligent video analytics to uh, look for quality control problems on my manufacturing line, uh, I need to take real-time action. It can't wait. So bandwidth and latency is key. Uh, and then we think about the agility and cloud-native nature of these types of applications, right? both an artificial intelligence or homegrown applications through a DevOps-like approach, they need to live in a, in a container-like approach in that physical device built for that environment. And then we think about security, right? In this case, it's even more so about physical security because this, this, this device, right, especially when we talk about edge outside of my centralized data center, uh, it's at the edge sitting in that cell tower. How do I make sure nobody has physical access to that device? Uh, for example, to pull out the hard drive and, and get a lot of data. Uh, and certainly skilled staff is a big challenge, right, uh, from an edge perspective. And we have a full edge strategy of, of what we're trying to accomplish with a number of ruggedized, hardened platforms, depending on what the environment looks like. Uh, so it could be the, the a battle-hardened version where I put in a Pelican pace and it's bouncing around a field for me to go do field surveys for oil and gas. I obviously need a very you know ruggedized platform for that. Or it could just still be a retail environment where, hey, it's it's fairly clean in nature. I just don't have, I don't want to put any, uh, take up any additional retail floor space, uh, right, for these assets to achieve some type of outcome. So how do I have a small footprint and a half a rack and, and tuck it away in a corner, right? Because it may not have the, the full data center environment that I would uh, in my central data center. So I'd like to pull on a comment that you made around the, the skilled staff piece. That's probably the biggest hurdle, and it's very similar to the organizational change we talked about before. But IoT is going to involve you know, thousands of devices across thousands of sites, potentially, like you alluded to, in remote areas 
where we may not have staff. And, and so the challenge is, is uh, those devices need to have instrumentation and management capabilities, which Dell's gateways obviously do. But we also have to have a different operating paradigm, too. The gear that's out at the edge is going to have a different R, um, TCO or ROI around a longer life cycle. We're going to have a five, we're not going to have the standard five year life cycle like we'd have in the data center. Some of this gear may be, you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the field and have to go through firmware upgrades due to your security uh, issues you brought up earlier. But that operating model and efficiencies at scale become a, a really big deal. Uh, I only bring this up because we've got customers that have done IoT with a Raspberry Pi device. And while it works great initially, all of this stuff that Alan and I are talking about uh, start to show that those, those commodity devices start to fall apart over time because of the environmentals, because of the maintenance, and more importantly, because of some of the lack of management infrastructure and being able to re-image them and so on and so forth. I'd like to look a little more closely at the issue of remote work. Now, we've seen, of course, uh, quite a surge in remote work during the pandemic, and most people believe that remote work will continue to be part of the new normal. How does infrastructure need to change to support remote work? So this is a great question, Stan, and, and I would pick on the word remote. Um, we're calling it hybrid work at Insight because we have been doing remote work for the last 18 months or so in most of our industries. And there was a big pivot to adopt VPN and VDI and, and remote desktops and, and pushing security perimeters and so on and so forth. But the part that's even more interesting for, for us at Insight is the fact that in the next six months to a year, we're going to go to a hybrid working environment where I'm going to have people working from home two days a week and working from the office three days a week or vice versa, or potentially working from different offices. And, and that poses a very interesting infrastructure problem, um, all the way from network transport, all the way up to server assets. And you know, Alan alluded to the fact earlier that speed of light latency issue. I need to have a very similar look and feel whether I'm working at home or whether I'm in an office and I should have the same security or similar security instrumentation from a software perspective. Um, your question was specifically around infrastructure, and the infrastructure piece really ties into networking and, and security infrastructure, making sure that my security controls and firewalls and intrusion detection and things like that in the data center and in my offices can extend out to the you know, remote devices out in the field and having a Seamless security experience is probably the biggest hurdle, but then remote desktop and those technologies also come to bear um, for a lot of our remote workers. It's a much more efficient way sometimes to have, you know, CAD CAM and, and heavy workloads be run remotely, but then that has a huge pivot into technologies like Dell's VX Rail, for example. Dell's VX Rail is a, a perfect transport for, for VDI. And Alan, I, I assume you've seen this shift the last 18 months and have watched that pick up, I would, I would think. <laughs> it is amazing to see how quickly most uh, organizations adapted to the new reality, right? Because I think we all felt we needed to to survive, right? We had to continue to conduct business even with the challenge of the pandemic. Uh, and, and we saw these trends happening really over the last 10 years. Uh, really of like this, the workforce itself is evolving. And I think it's kind of interesting now that everybody's had a taste of this and from an individual perspective, this is now going to be kind of de facto standard for organizations because they need to fight for talent. And a lot of talent saying, demanding, should say, right? A lot of, a lot of people out there demanding, I want some part of remote work. I need a work-life balance and, and using technology is able me to work anywhere, anytime. Uh, and be more productive for the organization. So there's an interesting dichotomy going on of like, what does that look like for every organization? How do I enable this long term, right? Not just short term. Everybody reacted, but now everybody's like, okay, now that I've done that initial reaction, everybody has some services. Now that we're starting to hopefully get to some sort of uh, new reality, what does this look like for remote work? And how do I enable that? Because work does happen anytime and anywhere. And these new solutions, when I think about it overall from an ecosystem, and I loved a few of the things you said in your narrative there, it's about the endpoint device and the end user experience, right? I, I, I care about all the stuff in the infrastructure to make that a reality for the end users. But at the end of the day, they have to have a good experience. And certainly, as you alluded to, right, the law of physics is a, is a key one. And security becomes a, a key concern here because I can secure things better, right, uh, at the perimeter. 
for example, like we have organizations all right now doing things with us of deploying out SD WAN edges and a laptop out to remote workers to do things from a secure nature basis, uh, you know, sitting in their homes. And then I loved what you said also there, Andy, too, about the applications. Because again, we look at it from the application lens. VX Rail is a great platform for us to land on to modernize, automate, and transform the data center to, to help enable VDI and make it real. But it's, again, back to the applications that the end users are using. So there's new technologies that have really forced that forward into the marketplace that ha- have made this real for people. You, you kind of brought up CAD CAM. Uh, that was very difficult to do 12 years ago. Now that I have high-end GPUs in the data center that are providing that same high-performance experience as I would sitting at a workstation, make that real for people. I'd like to pursue the topic of security just a bit further. Uh, it's on everyone's mind, of course. And hybrid cloud, of course, as we mentioned before, is very widespread. Uh, how do cyber defenses need to change for hybrid cloud? So that's a, a great question, too, and it's related to what Alan was just talking about with SD-WAN with remote work. But our, our perimeter has changed. Um, we used to have a, a walled moat, if you will, you know, the the old castle mentality where I had walls around my data center and I had a firewall that was the moat across, or the bridge across the moat, I should say. And that was how we secured things. And we thought that that was the right way to operate. Well, with a hybrid cloud, you have network connections and infrastructure that are running in other places, whether that's Amazon or Azure, Google or Apollo. And so that that bridge across the moat, that that firewall we have now has plumbing that goes across VPNs and SD-WAN connections and uh, lease lines out to these these other environments. And now my perimeter looks like Swiss cheese. Uh, so I I can't rely on that that old school you know fence or moat mentality with a castle wall. I start to have to embed security through every aspect of the infrastructure, both physical and virtual. And so we're seeing a lot of software defined and you know you can put an asterisk next to it, but software defined security that's embedded out at the endpoints and the laptops and desktops in the network, uh, doing incident detection there, all the way through hypervisors and containers and, and embedding firewalls and embedding technology. Um, Dell, Dell has a whole bunch of partnerships with a lot of these specific security vendors I'm alluding to, but you, you really have to have a defense and depth strategy and embedded every layer of the virtual infrastructure, both on premises and in the cloud. Uh, I, I, you brought up a couple of great points there, Andy. I'd like to pull on one that probably a lot of listeners may not be familiar with. Like uh, you said, embedded into a lot of Dell technologies. Like we have a whole, OEM power edge business that people necessarily don't even know exists, right? Where all these security appliance companies are embedding their solution directly into power edge. So pretty incredible to see what we do to enable it even outside of our traditional walls, right? Where customers are taking our technology and deploying it in an appliance, you know, from a, a specific security vendor. Uh, but one thing I, I think is extremely important from a Dell Technologies perspective, right? is it really is an end-to-end approach, meaning I love everything that uh, Andy just walked through and the Swiss cheese was a great analogy. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, so it's how do I keep components that sit at the edge, whether it's in my, my standard data center or at the edge, right, devices we talked about, especially where physicality come into play, how do I keep those secure from design and development phase all the way through delivery? And there are a number of things we do for all of our hardware platforms. And Andy kind of alluded to this, right? Moving from our client-based systems all the way to everything we do in the data centers built and developed in the same way. So think about even from the standpoint that we're designing and developing the next generation of products, right? We just launched our brand new 15G PowerEdge servers, you know, back in March. But you can imagine the team's very heavy in the development phase. For 16G, what's next, right, from both Intel and AMD from an x86 perspective? All of that design and development work has to happen from a secure perspective using this type approaches to ensure that the development phase is secure. Because we've seen what that what can happen when it's not, right? There's definitely been some high-profile examples of you know challenges that were caused by that. And then we think about sourcing materials, right? So we have a number, think about a PowerEdge server and everything we do at Dell Technologies is actually at the, at its core a server, right? Whether it's a 
storage appliance, whether it's a scale-out approach uh, using VxRail or VxFlex, whether it's a converged infrastructure, at the end of the day, right, the, the server's at the core of everything. So being able to source and, and make sure that I have good sources for all that material is extremely important, right, that I have security built into that phase. And then once I've sourced all those goods, I've got to build things and manufacture it in a secure way. Uh, and lots of things that we do in that phase to ensure it happens. And then what we just recently announced uh, that was pretty exciting was this last phase. We think about delivery. So once I've des- designed a product, sourced the materials, and built it, now what was out of my control? Once I shipped it, right, and it went into that UPS truck, was it really secure? We've all heard about man-in-the-middle attacks where somebody puts a listening device or tampers with firmware before it ever hits the customer's dock. Then they deploy it, and suddenly they're at risk. Well, we have something called Dell Technology Secured Component Verification to guarantee that that can't happen. And as the only end-to-end tier one config to order supplier, we're in a unique advantage position to really bring things like that to market. Let's turn our attention to application development. Now, in the digital era, change happens very quickly, and organizations can waste no time getting new applications into production. That means implementing DevOps, DICD, and, as you mentioned earlier, ModOps. Perhaps you can explain further. Sure. So the, the, the key takeaway from, from this question is, is a pivot that a lot of traditional infrastructure folks are going to go through. So uh, the DevOps mindset is all about continuous integration and continuous delivery, which is very different than the way a lot of organizations have, have operated in the past. So it's, it's, you know, change happens not quickly, but change happens continually might be a better way to say that. Our mod ops strategy at Insight is to enable and support uh, DevOps and that continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery of code. And the key here is, is that we have to take a lot of the manual processes out of provisioning, out of life cycling, out of refreshing. Uh, so there's a big component in mod ops to an automation stack. And whether that's, you know, salt stack or puppet or ansible or v realize automation, for example, or there's a whole bunch of new uh, automation stacks that have been born out of the, the DevOps uh, world. The, the key from an infrastructure perspective, though, is we need to be talking to APIs. We need to be talking to at least native APIs or API gateways and being able to automate all of the all the steps to the life cycle of an asset in a in a data center or a cloud. And it's key to having modern infrastructure that supports that. Uh, almost all the new uh, Dell compute platforms have uh, API access through all of those automation stacks I talked about and others to be able to provision image upgrade firmware um, and deprovision and and deprecate those kind of functionalities. Um, Dell's new uh, blade offerings uh, are are rich in API and provisioning. And and all of that becomes very important to support a mod ops or a modern operations strategy. Uh, It's all necessary to handle that word continuous because there's no longer a chance for a human to get involved or, or we shouldn't have humans involved in those steps. It goes back to what I said earlier of modernize, automate, and transform. It's about automation everywhere. And and thanks for pulling a couple of those threads there, Andy, and recognizing some of the hard work that the development teams have been doing, uh, Dell Technologies, to make that real around our platforms. And that's exact. you kind of called out all of the key platforms that make those real, whether it's Chef, Puppet, Ansible, et cetera, Terraform, being able to actually utilize that for infrastructure as a code on-prem and off-prem is extremely important, right? Because now I have a single automated process on and off-prem. And by the way, on top of that, you kind of layered on some things there that's built into VMware Cloud Foundation, right? When you talk about modernize, automate, transform, think about it at its very core. It was really first doing virtualization, doing more with less, then bringing in and consolidating storage with vSAN, and now really layering in that NSX, right, to virtualize the network and make hybrid cloud real and make it easier and more transparent for users to move applications, right, especially that CICD pipeline that we just described, to take that application and move it in a container on and off-prem seamlessly is is key, right? Because we know, again, this is a hybrid cloud world. We don't live in one location, right? It's not a data center anymore. 
Uh, so being able to work with partners such as Insights is extremely important for us here to enable that and make that real for our customers where they may not have the expertise in-house. When it comes to application development, there's certainly a lot of interest in containers. Uh, perhaps you could explain just a bit further just what is the optimal infrastructure to support containers? So this is a, a super open-ended question, Stan, and I love how you phrased it. I, I don't know if there is an optimal infrastructure, um, and it's truly the wild, wild rust right now. So containers were born primarily out of the open source community, and, and effectively you can run containers on almost anything. But the root of your question is your mileage may vary, and we're seeing with a lot of our client base with containers is is you get what you pay for. So if you don't have modern storage integration and modern compute and infrastructure networking integration with your container platform, um, retrofitting a lot of those security controls and a lot of our, our data protection, you know, ransomware-like protection functionality becomes very difficult um, if I'm running on a pure open source white box like offering, like a lot of container infrastructure started. So we heavily recognize that you need um, container integrated storage through uh, what they call a CSI driver so that I can leverage snapshotting, so I can leverage replication. And, and, and the report to that question is, well, a lot of containers are ephemeral and don't need protection. Well, yeah, until we find out that, you know, somebody put a whole bunch of important data inside a specific container, and then now you do need protection and you do need replication. So having some of that modern storage infrastructure that integrates into the container platform is important. And, and Dell has a lot of that in their storage play. Um, a lot of their new storage offerings have specific CSI drivers into Kubernetes and into OpenStack and things like that. Um, or OpenShift, I should say. And then the network integration is key too. being able to have network integration into a lot of those security products we talked about before at the container level is super important. And then all the stuff that Alan just mentioned about scaling out and being able to provision quickly ties into a container architecture because containers grow much quicker than VMs did in a, in a virtualized world. We see container sprawl times 10, if you will. And so if my infrastructure supporting the containers can't keep up, we're going to overrun that infrastructure very quickly. And, and that that's kind of a segue into, you know, Dell's got some really interesting uh, technologies that scale linearly to keep up with the, the container platform. Alan, would you care to elaborate on some of that? Yeah, no, I, you hit on a number of fantastic points there, Andy. And uh, I, I think we probably do have a little bit uh, of an opinionated view here from a VMware perspective, but here, here's what I'd say and, and what I think is extremely important. And I think where a lot of our customers are struggling, right, is expertise in-house to support these environments. So, uh, hey, Kubernetes is great, but skill set's still difficult to find. Uh, so how do I take advantage of everything that I need to do to support the business for what we just walk through and mod ops for the CICD pipeline? Uh, and really be able to bring that experience on-prem with a set of infrastructure that our team is already used to using, right? They're already used to using uh, vSphere. They already know vCenter. Uh, could I, for example, be able to deploy something like the Tanzu Kubernetes grid to make this easier for customers to manage and deploy? That's what it is. It's about how do we grow and scale this at an enterprise-grade platform side-by-side side because Containers are great. That CI/CD pipeline, that's where it came from, right? It's extremely important to make that real for the developers, for them to bring that continuous integration into those platforms. But, you know, there's still stationary static VMs that are extremely important to the business, right, that run the business today uh, that are going to continue to run. So it's about how do I create multiple environments with a single control plane, in this case called vCenter, for both VMs and containers? And then break that up by specific applications. Remember, I, I kind of pulled on that string earlier of applications and workloads. You're probably seeing a common theme uh, from how we approach this. It's about the workload. So maybe, for example, I create one workload domain in VMware Cloud Foundation automating with everything we just talked about uh, for a SQL database consolidation effort, right, where I'm trying to take advantage and build out a modern data lake using SQL 2019. I create another workload domain for what we just talked about with Horizon VDI and making that real, right? Sitting side by side with the database that they might be trying to access. Couldn't figure out a better way to make that happen, right? When both the VM sit next to each other. And then we think about uh, workload domains just for 
for services, right? To automate things from a VRA perspective, for vRealize automation to again modernize, automate. Remember the A, A, A is about automating this process using software defined architectures. And then finally, as I just kind of allude to the, the Tanzu Kubernetes grid, TTD, right? With vSphere and Tanzu being able to build and orchestrate using common platforms like Kubernetes to make that real for our customers. So giving them all the tools that they need and are already familiar with and have expertise in and allow them to manage them side by side. How can members of our audience get started with an Insight Dell technology solution? Whom should they call? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is you can call either of us, right? Um, We have a tight partnership and you can reach out to us through your, if you have an Insight relationship, if you want to go to insight.com, great. Um, If you want to reach out to your existing Dell teams and and mention to them that you want to work with Insight, um, the the, the beauty of of our partnership is Dell's deep portfolio of solutions is augmented by the fact that Insight has non-Dell solutions and skills in integrating other third-party functionality and and you know tools into that overall solution and and i had a you know i had a theme through my conversations around you know management and and operational efficiency and we spend a lot of time with our clients helping with non-technology changes in the organization or transformation to enable this digital transformation too alan and andrew before we close what should members of our audience remember so from my perspective uh, there's a few key takeaways. One of them is, is we need to modernize our operations and our infrastructure in the data center to adapt to a hybrid cloud architecture. And that's more than just technology. We actually also think that organizational transformation is key to that hybrid cloud journey as well. Another key point from our conversations is we're seeing growth at the edge and we're moving from traditional data centers to centers of data. Uh, All of the talk that we just had applies to the edge just as much as a data center or the cloud. And we also have to think about automation in our transformation journey at every aspect of our architectures to enable the DevOps journey and to modernize application delivery. Uh, So all great points uh, as we've kind of been talking about our our whole little uh, webinar here. So, uh, Andy, you know, what I also think about it as cloud is not a destination. Really, it's an operating model. So think about that in context of everything we've talked about. And remember the three key areas that I, I hinted to earlier, the laws of physics, the laws of the land, and spin. Those are the three areas I need to think about to make a good decision from an application and workload perspective of where should that application live. And remember, I kind of talked about the four areas to modernize, retain, retire, or migrate applications through its life cycle, and where those land in that continuum, right, from a public, hybrid, or private perspective is extremely important. So again, for us to be able to provide that level of automation on-premise, just like it is in the public cloud, is extremely important to, to the business, right, to really leverage Technology is a competitive differentiator uh, and not just, you know, an, an asset. And I'll leave you with this last thing. Um, we have a phenomenal tool uh, that we've had out there for quite some time. It's available to any customer uh, called Live Optics. And Live Optics is a great way to get you started from an application or workload perspective on that journey. It allows us to collect, visualize, and up to you, share data if you would like. So this is you own it. It's just metadata information around, you know, vCenter and, and Windows WMI interfaces that we collect to give you insights into your infrastructure from a CPU memory disk perspective, and then also get real-time workload analyzing of how much cloud cost would be for that specific workload. So imagine being able to see I have 500 VMs, and I can now make good workload placement discussions uh, with each one of those application owners because I can show them the actual cost of running on or off-prem. Uh, so super powerful tool to get you started. There's no cost, no obligation. It's completely secure. Uh, just go to liveoptics.com to learn more. That's great information, Alan and Andrew. Thanks so much. Well, that is all the time we have in this webcast. Here, thanks once again to Alan Klingerman, Chief Technology Strategist for Power Edge Plus Workloads at Dell Technologies, and Andrew Nelson, Principal Architect at Insight. 
Thanks to both for explaining how to implement the right IT infrastructure to digitally transform your organization. For additional information on these topics, please see the resources area of your webcast player, where you'll find links and documents of interest. And thanks for joining us. For Insight, Dell Technologies, and IDG, I'm Stan Gibson.